Welcome to EdTech Speaks, a podcast bringing guests together to share their expertise and advice on navigating business and education in a technology-driven world. From entrepreneurs to vendors, higher education to corporate leaders, we'll uncover their perspective regarding the latest trends and technologies impacting your career or business. Our podcast is made possible by Downing EdTech Consulting, where people and technology connect. Hosted by Cher Downing, an experienced executive spanning a higher education and corporate career with specific focus on the EdTech industry, Dr. Downing is also an international and national presenter, author, and regular media contributor. Now here is your host, EdTech strategist, Dr. Cher Downing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to EdTech Speaks, a podcast where we bring guests to share their expertise and advice on navigating business and education in a technology-driven world. Our goal is to provide you with options for products, services, and knowledge that can help benefit you or your business. I'm Cher Downing, your host, and today I want to introduce my guest, Roger Sands, with YBOT. Hi, Roger. Welcome. Good morning, Cher. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I'm glad to uh, be part of your show. Well, we're excited to have you here because uh, YBOT is definitely an impactful product that's coming into our area and really, I think, going to change some of the way that we do things. So I'm going to let you start out and tell us a little bit about your background and yourself and how YBOT came together. Absolutely. I've been in the networking technology space for about 30 years, and I've been running high-tech business units for uh, over 25 years. More recently, I was at a wireless startup company here in the Boston area, Klubris Networks. I was an executive there and co-CEO. And uh, that company was acquired by HP. And at HP, I ran their worldwide Wi-Fi business for seven years. Wow. And so it was during that journey, working with CIOs and IT leaders and higher education uh, companies all over the globe, when the idea of YBOT came about. Right. So we saw a major transformation take place in the market, cloud computing, right, with the applications sure. and hosting of cloud services. And we also saw what we call the mobile enterprise, right, where if you look at higher education, students and professors and, and staff members were using more and more mobile devices for access to information 24 by 7. And so this transformation that took place is extremely valuable because it's increasing productivity, right? It's it's getting access to that information, whether it's research or collaboration or communication amongst their colleagues. But at the Absolutely. same time, it brings a lot of challenges, right? The, the mobile <laughs> infrastructure, Wi-Fi technology, which now we treat like a utility, but unfortunately it has intermittent issues. It's just a complexity of, of RF, of high density environments like higher education where you have a lot of demands on the network. And so that's where YBOT was born. It was all around understanding these complex environments and building a system that leverages automations to help solve business problems. But that's the overview. I've worked at high tech startups and Fortune 150 companies and bringing that technology get together with my co-founder, Neil Gupta, to build uh, to build YBOT. Well, this is fantastic because as I tell several guests and my audience knows, any of us that have worked in this industry in the last 25 years truly grew up with the industry because the industry has changed every single day since we got into it. And so you fast forward to now and people say, well, why did you get into this? And I always say, I'm not sure I ever chose to get into this. I think it chose me and just as for you, it shows you and it pulled you in and you started to see all of these things come together. And I'm so excited to talk about the automation part because I think, you know, we used to think about Wi-Fi purely for institutional need, business need, really big product need, enterprise solutions. And all of a sudden now you have an enterprise system in your home. Everything that you own is running off of your Wi-Fi, you know, your doorbell, your refrigerator, your television, all of these things. And when it goes down, we really are just, we're just shocked that it's not there or that it has a lapse or heaven forbid we see the little wheel spinning on our Mac <laughs> products because 
we're just not used to be, it being slow anymore. We're not used to having any disruption. We're used to that fast speed, that instant reaction to everything. So the automation piece, I'm really fascinated. Tell me a little bit about what you're using. Obviously, we're you know we're looking at artificial intelligence, but really, you know, what are you using to try to figure out what are the types of things that are going on with people and with business and, and how it's being reacted to? Sure, sure. And just to tie it again back to the work we're doing at HP, when we're supporting our higher education customers around the globe, and they had these business continuity issues, right? Whether it was in a classroom, high density classroom, you know, <laughs> lecture hall with 100 students, whether it was a dorm room, challenging areas, mm-hmm. right, with dorm room students doing all kinds of applications, and they were having these intermittent problems. And so I would send my top engineers to these customer sites, because obviously our goal was to deliver, you know, best in class solution to these customers. And the challenge with that is I'd get folks on site and these are very, very good engineers. And, but these intermittent problems, right, would go away. <laughs> and so then yeah. we'd wait around, you know, and we'd be sitting in classrooms and even dorm rooms for days, right? And waiting and capturing the information. And that's what drove us to what you were asking about is the automation piece. So we realized that the networks are so dynamic, right? They're living and breathing and constantly changing with new technology, right? You have voice recognition systems now, like Alexa's in the dorm rooms. You have gaming devices. You mentioned thermostats, right? Building automation. And so what we realized was that we needed to move to this automation. Now, what does the automation consist of? Two components. We have IoT sensors. IoT sensors that go on the customer prem, dorm rooms, classrooms, auditoriums, and they're doing the monitoring of the Wi-Fi environment 24 by 7 combined with edge computing, right? Because we're processing, in some cases, volumes of information. So we have to do edge computing right on the sensor. And then we send metadata to our cloud application. We're running an Amazon and we, in the cloud, we have our AI engine. So you were asking what we're doing here. The AI engine is taking data from tens, hundreds, or thousands of sensors and processing all that in real time, looking for events that are impacting business continuity, looking for events that are impacting the students and the professors and the staff when they're having these Wi-Fi connectivity problems. So we analyze the data. We do pattern recognition, behavioral profiling with our AI engine. And then in the dashboard, we'll identify what the performance problems are and how to solve them. So we've taken the complexity out of this whole what's happening in these ecosystems to an automation platform, all remote, so IT can just connect in, get proactive alerts when there's performance-related issues. So I really love that because... Having worked in IT and having seen all of the things that go on and all of the failures that happen through systems, even just connecting system to system, one of the things that I think has always been a, a downfall of it is we only look at it in a reactive one directional pattern. Exactly. So we wait to see what happens. And then we say, once we fix it, well, let's see if it happens again. <laughs> and then we'll go back and we'll tweak what we did before. <laughs> That's been our problem solving for many, many years. And so you're you're coming at it from a, a couple of different directives where you're not only reactive to it when you need to be, but you're proactive and you're starting to filter out what's happening. What are we seeing? I remember the first year that we really started to put Wi-Fi in dorms across the country. And immediately people were, were shocked at the amount of usage. And Faculty thought this is wonderful. Students are working hard. You know, they're getting things ready for my (laughs) class. And then they found out that students were gaming. Suddenly, I remember having a conversation talking about the fact that we're paying to support students, but it's not for their academic benefit. It's for their pleasure. It's their gaming. And I remember I was at a conference and people were talking about, well, maybe we should charge them. And we're like, well, how are you going to know if they're working on a paper or playing a game? That's pretty finite to have to dive down and sort those things out. But that's where we started, which was put a dime in and you get 10 minutes of Wi-Fi kind of feeling. Now it's so interwoven with everything we do. And so ultimately, you're seeing patterns of maybe on the weekends, you're seeing a higher trend of usage 
not necessarily because they're doing academic work, but they still need support. And late at night, you're seeing a higher usage, but that probably is academic work because they have things due the next day that they've put off to the last minute. So your solution is saying, we're not interested in what particularly they're working on. We just want to make sure that the system is always there for them whenever they need it. And we're going to try to get ahead of the curve in terms of where something may go wrong. You summarized extremely well, right? So we're doing, it's actually a transformation from, and you've got the experience from reactive, which you're right. And I've been in this space and we've got great management platforms and data that we can look at in real time. And then when problems come up, we drill into them to solve them, right? And that's <laughs> reactive and it's, and it's where we've come from. And that, you know, was better than it was 10 years ago, but we're transforming the industry. We're taking that, which is a highly reactive model and we've made it into proactive right and and so we want to get ahead of it we want to monitor trends with our ai engine so that it can be aware ahead of time when things start to degrade which is often the case right in typical networks they start to degrade before they really have an impact on the users so if you can get those alerts and notifications and take action now you're going to have next generation high availability for your users And I also want to follow up briefly on the use case you were talking about the dorm rooms. Mm -hmm. It's classic because we work with a lot of universities. And you're right. During the week, the busiest time typically is between 10 at night and 2 in the morning. (laughs) Right. And so and and you're right. It's a combination. Obviously, there's a lot of research, a lot of homework and studying going on, of course, because they have to get the projects done for the next day. But combined with that, obviously, is there's gaming, there's video, there's movie watching. Right. The whole ecosystem is built around Wi-Fi as the on-ramp to the internet. And so it's become just the norm of everybody's lifestyle. And IT in most universities is not going to be too interested in working between 10 at night and 2 in the morning, understandably, because they've got family time, they're sleeping. And so how do you get a handle on this, right? The only way is automation, right? AI technology. Absolutely. It's monitoring these trends at 2 in the morning to validate what's happening, where are there potential issues on the network that are impacting the users and having that information when you come in at eight in the morning, nine in the morning to say, oh, here's what happened. Here's why it happened. And here's how to solve it. All that's provided with Wibot. I think it's it, you all have just tapped into the very beginning of this because yes. from a user perspective, particularly, you know, again, using our dorm example, all of a sudden now I'm FaceTiming with my family all over the country, you know, yes. my sister, my parents, whomever. Back in the day, you had one phone at the end of the hallway and everybody mm. shared it, you know, and you took turns dialing out and paying long distance uh, fees. So that piece has changed. And that that's a really emotionally important piece of, of living in the dorm and, and yes. living away from home is at two in the morning, when I have a problem, I want to be able to call my parents and see my parents clearly and talk through this. I think also in terms of for the workers on the IT side, we hire oftentimes reactively. We don't have enough people that are watching the servers. So we add three more people to watch the servers. We don't really identify what's wrong with the servers. We just keep adding more people to watch them still go down. It's always, to me, it's always been a, you know, kind of an interesting scenario that we think more people will somehow capture reactive situations faster. Whereas you're saying, based on the data that's coming out of this, you can now hire smarter because now you're looking for a skill set based on we know this is what hits our, our situation in our particular institution, or we know the time of year where we see, obviously, finals week, we see our usage go way up. We always used to joke about in October, we have a dead zone because students aren't really to the end yet. They just started school. We kind of lose them for a little bit. Then November comes and they realize, wow, I've got papers due. I need to get my grades <laughs> up and usage you know, suddenly spikes. So you have that ability then to provide data to these institutions to say, who do we need and what type of skill set do we need? Not just this person left, we're just going to replace the same old position we've always had. Yes, absolutely. And in addition, we're focused on Wi-Fi automation because that's where a lot of the business continuity and performance problems occur, obviously. But the value of Wi-Bot is not only does it 
do Wi-Fi, but we do wired analysis as well. So your core infrastructure devices like DHCP and DNS and the applications that are critical to these universities, all of those we have in addition to the AI engine, we've got synthetic network testing. So Mm. proactive synthetic testing. So now IT can get end user quality metrics in addition to the AI analysis of what the users are experiencing across the campus. So for planning, incredible data to start to look at, because as you know, majority of universities have been around for a long time. And while we kind of glued together systems, you know, in the in the early 90s, those systems are now getting very old. And and we're looking at for one, we're looking at do we keep servers? Do we move to the cloud? You know, we start to look at what software is working for us. How are we getting more for our money and having more applications available through a singular system as opposed to piecemeal and use lots of different systems together? We're looking at tying our enterprise together better. Where are we getting the most maximum benefit for our users globally? Because universities have now become global institutions thanks to online learning. So it's no longer worrying about just the students sitting across the street in the dorm. Now you've got someone half a world away who needs that same reaction, just like that person sitting across from you. The other thing about your AI portion of this is that it can take care of some of those remedial things and you can use workers that are already in your shop for so many better things. We've all had those wish lists of positions we fill if we just had, you know, the line item and the budget money and and until there's either like a, a huge outage or something that, that allows us to get extra money for that, we just keep that wish list running. Now we've got the opportunity to move people over to that because the system is running and being more self-sufficient than it ever has before. So Exactly. Think- and in fact, that's that's the power of the system, because now we want those individuals to be able to focus on other business critical activities for the universities, right? And so having a system, we save up to 90% on mean time to resolution. So when there are intermittent issues, dramatically saving time. And then as we mentioned, we're proactive because we're constantly monitoring 24 by seven, the entire ecosystem to look for these type of events to notify IT as well before they have an impact. So yes, the goal here is to enable universities to be more efficient, provide better user experience, And, you know, we've worked with a number of universities where they've said that the Wi-Fi network is actually becoming a decision making for the students coming to the university. Like when Mm -hmm. word starts getting out that it's not up to par because the students are so attached to it now, then it actually can impact enrollment. So there's so many reasons for providing better continuity for your professors and your users and your staff. In addition to saving extremely valuable, you won't be able to scale IT organizations to keep up with the demands and the dynamic nature of what's happening on these networks. And it's interesting because part of that is obviously generations that are now being raised who don't remember not having technology. You know, I I always tell people anyone who is middle aged spent half their life without it and half their life with it. So we know both worlds, but everyone under us doesn't remember a time where there wasn't technology. So they're smarter in how they shop. Um, They recognize the ability to go anywhere that they want to go to school. But last year with the pandemic, 2020 really emphasized that because if they suddenly switched to online classes and it wasn't working well, That made their decision about going back this fall. I've heard this time and time again from people who have said, oh, my child transferred because last year was just such a mess. And I'm like, well, but they're going back to campus this year, right? Yeah, but they're just worried. What if it happens again? You know, what if the country had to shut down again and they haven't fixed that situation? So it's become now an actual recruitment piece that we we didn't use before. You know, before it was, we have rolling green grass and beautiful buildings and lots of activities. And now we're saying, you know, <laughs> we have gigablast and, and 5G and all of these, you know, terms that are now becoming every day because students want no break in service and they want the ability to just move seamlessly wherever they're going. So talk to me a little bit about what the pandemic was like for, for all of you and kind of, you know, your your client size in terms of universities and, and uh, how that all came together last year. 
Yeah, great question. You know, and it's unfortunate, obviously, for the pandemic. And, you know, we wish the best to everybody out there that's dealing with it. It's been quite the challenge. You know, initially, because we do a lot in education, K through 12 and higher education, there was initially when the pandemic hit, there was a, you know, an immediate pause in <laughs> YBOT's business because everybody, understandably, you know, went home. And so, sure. you know, at the moment, there was just a pause. So we took a pause for a short period of time. But what was fascinating is, once that pause subsided, and uh, then there was just even more need for YBOT, right? Because not only were the networks that you talked about extremely dynamic, changing, building automation, neighbors, student hotspots. I mean, there's so many things now, smartwatches that are coming into this ecosystem that IT has had a hard time keeping up. Then when universities started to you know, move back into the education space, it was hybrid learning. And so is exactly what you said. That put an increased demand on these networks in a different way because you had students, whether they were home or in some cases, they started to go back to the dorms, but they were isolated to the dorms. And so they weren't used to that model, right? Because most of the time, the students for the classes and the lab, they were in person in session. And so it actually created what we call even a higher dynamic environment because you had some students in classrooms, some in dorm rooms, some at home, and but all of them needed access to information. And the professors in the past, just like you were talking about generational, and both my parents were teachers, right? I have a huge respect for uh, for the education sector, but a lot of them weren't leveraging technology to its fullest potential, <laughs> right? And they were comfortable and it worked. Once the pandemic hit, there was no choice. Right. So video collaboration calls like this. Right. And they had to do remote learning. And so that drove demand even further. So to answer your question, there was a pause immediately, understandably. And then after that, just a huge interest and demand for YBOT, because not only did it support these dynamic environments, but it's all remote. And when you think of the pandemic and covid Unfortunately, it created travel restrictions, right? And you had to be very controlled of where you went. You couldn't just walk into dorm rooms to solve problems anymore because of this. And so having remote eyes and ears, in addition to the automation, was just a game changer. And so we've seen a dramatic increase on our on already healthy growth at YBOT because of it. Excellent. And I think it's, you know, it, it's so interesting because... We sent everyone home and then we said, hmm, who's going to run everything if the IT people are all at home? (laughs) You know, because we've gotten so immersed in cybersecurity situations that we've really locked everything down. And, you know, you heard stories of, well, we're alternating, you know, this person comes in this day, this person comes in that day. We really, we didn't have a sound plan for supporting systems from afar. You know, and obviously, depending upon the size of the school, some were able to react faster than others. But it definitely has been a difficulty because, again, we, we've we never planned for uh, what I call the ultimate outage, right. whether that's a system outage or as in the pandemic, people outage. But it was really interesting to see the reaction times and the reaction overall of, of what institutions were doing. What are the size of institutions that you work with? Do you work with all levels? Do yeah. You have particular? Okay. No, no, no. It's a, the, the beautiful thing about YBOT is um, it's actually vendor agnostic. So it works in any yeah. Wi-Fi ecosystem. And it's also vertically agnostic. Now, I know we're focused here on higher education, but the system, because it's based on the Wi-Fi standards, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Wi-Fi standards fix. So it doesn't matter whether you're a small institution or a large institution. We support and work in all those environments. Okay. And then let me ask you, because I'm going to tell our listeners, you can go onto their website at ybot.com. And we'll be sure and give that address on our on our uh, podcast space. But you can see a demo on there, which I think is really fascinating. But I do want to ask about Ybot in the wild, because I really love that name. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that is the problem of the week and case studies. So tell me a little bit about what you do in this area, because I think that's the problem of the week is is fabulous. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, the Wild in the Wild, as you can imagine from the name, we just have so many stories because now, you know, we're in so many customers globally and, and from our past lives, of course. 
that we realize, again, I use the term a few times dynamic, but there's just constant challenges that are taking place. And so what we try to do at a Why Bought Wild, right, is bring content to users, right? Valuable content on what we're seeing, trends in the market, problem of the week, as you called it, which we say, look, here's something we've seen repetitively in the industry. So we want to make IT folks aware of it, right? And then, of course, use cases, right, to show you how you can benefit from this type of platform. So we put all that content right on the website for our listeners and our users. In addition to the, like you said, the demo, just to make it clear, we also do free trials, no obligation, because we want, we're a big fan of education and we want education customers to be able to see the actual solution, the AI engine working in their environment. So any customer that's interested in come to the website, fill out a form, and we'll we'll ship out a free um, a free trial unit for them to uh, to test out in their environment. That's wonderful, and I hope that our listeners take advantage of that. Because two of the things that I love about your website and, and about talking with you today, Roger, is your transparency. So IT is always shrouded in a cloud of mystery, and it's always pay no attention to the man behind the green curtain kind of concept. And so oftentimes you're sharing these stories of situations that have occurred and and potential fixes and things to look for. And oftentimes companies don't do that because they think, well, if we don't tell you, you have to come to us, you know, we'll, we'll fix it, but only after, you know, you sign the dotted line. So I'm so excited to, to hear that. And the idea of a free trial, which for anyone that works in IT, I mean, we have to test it. We we have to see how it works. We have to see how it yes. puts together. Exactly. Um, it's our natural curiosity. We just can't, we can't take it at face value. We're not good at that. <laughs> right. No, and so, we want you to see the simplicity, the automation, all that. And there's no obligation. We pay for shipping and everything. So it's just a nice benefit for those that are interested to, uh, you know, to try it out. That's fantastic. And for our listeners, I also want to point out when you go to the website, check out In the News. And this is something that I always like to point out to folks, which is the different types of audiences that you are being covered in. So things like Fierce Education, Market Scale, Mission Critical, the Boston Business Journal, Supply Chain Brain. Now, that is one that you know is up and coming supply chain clearly right now when everything's sitting on a barge in California, (laughs) everyone now knows what supply chain is. Nobody knew a year ago. Now everyone knows what that is. But the point is supply chain is, is huge in our industry. It's huge in our world and understanding how all of these things move around, you know, how those products get from point A to point B. And so getting covered in supply chain brain is really optimal for you. I see there's also areas in K through 12, MedTech Intelligence, e-learning inside, you really cover all the different industries. I mean, that's the beauty of YBOD is the industry is really secondary. It's about supporting the institution or the group or the business that you're talking to and just making things work. I mean, that's how simplistic it is. And that's the beauty of the product, I think. Yeah, um, thank you. No, we do. We do focus on a lot of verticals because we can help, right, with this transformation Um, We're the leaders in this AI technology, and we want to help all kinds of businesses with their business continuity and and solving these complex problems. We've lived it for 15 (laughs) years with resources on site and nights and weekends. And so I can tell you the team has lived it tremendously. And so we want to help now the industry and solve these complex um, performance issues. And I even see uh, you have a section on entertainment and conference venues which is another just pain point when, you know, as someone who's done a lot of presentations, it's always just a wild card when I get there, what's going to (laughs) happen. It's it's a complete wild card. You've lived it, right? What's fascinating about that vertical is every week, I know things have been slower, understandably over the past year and a half, but but when you get to a normal life cycle, every week you can have a different audience, right? (laughs) And so clientele, the types of devices, the applications can vary, even though they're all using Wi-Fi as the on-ramp to the internet. So we see such a diverse set of groups that come in, which puts an extra strain on IT organizations supporting those environments. But um, it's an exciting space for us. Again, we're very focused on education, but those verticals are um, all areas that, that need help and we can support that. Well, and what I like about it is those verticals help you create better educational situations because education is always the last one to try something. 
I mean, they're they're notorious for uh, slow adoption, slow implementation, slow support. It's just the nature of the beast because that's never been their primary focus. It's starting to shift now, but it's still difficult. But when you learn something from an industry, a corporation, you know, a conference, and you can bring that knowledge and that expertise back to education, it just makes it so much better. So I love that, you know, you're not siloed into one area, but you have that ability to to move around and to share that expertise across a wide variety of situations. It does um, add tremendous value to the solution, as you can imagine, because we have an AI engine, we're constantly adding what we call new signatures, right? So it doesn't matter the vertical, someone could come out with a new smartphone, right? New smart board or something like that. We identify with our solution, you know, performance related issue. Now we can roll that into our platform. Customers don't have to do anything. And now all of our customers have access to those new signatures overnight. So it makes, like you said, it makes for a much more robust solution as we're basically learning from the community. We have our core and then we keep learning and adding and, and adopting as the, as the technology evolves. And that truly is what is, makes successful in, in this industry is having that ability to be nimble, to be flexible and to adapt because we don't know what's coming out tomorrow. Right. You know, you look at the things that we use now that we didn't use five years ago, 10 years ago. It's just it's fascinating to me how quickly it's all changing. And we now have an expectation that we just plug and play. It's just going to go. And we're really disappointed when it doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what what's on the drawing board for YBOT? What's next? Yeah. So again, we're, we're, we're leading this transformation. As you mentioned, we're at the tipping point. So it's a very exciting point for us because over the next three to five years, as you can imagine, we envision this to be core in most verticals, mm-hmm. right? That are dependent on Wi-Fi because you need AI, you need automation. So from our point of view, we'll keep leading the industry, right? We're working on new technology for 2022. Um, obviously you have new standards like Wi-Fi 6E, right? Mm-hmm. Six you know gigahertz. So we're focused on, you know, supporting that, but we're going to keep enhancing our AI engine, as I mentioned, so we do more learning around these networks and so that we can adapt even faster. So for us, it's continued growth, vertical growth. We're expanding into Europe. Um, in fact, we have a very key account in the university sector in Europe right now that deployed our solution. So we're expanding into Europe. We're expanding across more verticals, but really continuing to enhance the overall position that we're in around the um, automation piece. Wonderful. Because I think, as you said, this is only going to keep going. And I think we're going to now see problem solving in a different way. We have a lot of people that are continuing to work remotely. They're not going back. Companies are saying we're not renting all this space, work from home. It's all fine. And so, you know, the need for figuring out too, how all of my employees are at 10 different locations, 10 different countries, all of these things are going to not go away. We're, we're going to actually start to embrace them, I think. Yes, so yeah, I think it's it, the it, new norm. Correct. It's going to just be very fluid and flexible environments. Well, and I can say from a faculty perspective, having solid systems is so vital to teaching because You build your lessons around what your systems do. And when you get in a classroom and nothing works, there is nothing worse in the world because everything you you planned went out the window. So you've lost that hour, those two hours, whatever your your classroom time is. But more importantly, this is something I always uh, used to talk to faculty about is it's how your students see you because your students don't say, oh, the university system has gone down. The students say, you don't understand how this works or you're not very good at this. You know, it's it, it's a it's a one to one situation in their right. mind because they just assume everyone knows everything and they don't realize all the the levels of complexity that classrooms have. And so it's it's so important that systems are live and they're constant and they're supportive so that faculty can get in there and do what they do best, which is not running the technology, but that it enhances what they're doing and it starts to change the way they teach. And we all know that once we change the way we teach and we start to become more immersive in the learning experience, our students do better and they perform at a much higher level than when, yes. when we bring them initially. 
So last question for you, what, what do you see as the trends that are coming just in general in our industry? We're obviously seeing growth and, and we're seeing lots of things pop up, but are you seeing things that, that you know, are just kind of sitting out there on the horizon aside from Bezos and everyone else going to the space? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think there's just going to be a dramatic increase. I know it's hard to believe in the number of connected devices. Right. We're seeing in automobiles. Right. Just yeah. the world is moving in that direction. We're working in, with companies that have sensors in furniture. Right. So mm. that they can keep track of attendance, meaning in terms of classrooms and, and auditoriums and and what type of utilization is happening in conference rooms. Right. So mm-hmm. I'm just giving you some examples from automobiles to sensors and, and furniture. But, you know, the green initiative with solar panels. And, and so there's just going to be the world is going to be even more connected. And I know where we are today, we already feel like it's very connected, but it's just going to be taken to another level over the next five plus years. And so we do need to continue to evolve and build out these next generation networks that can support this dynamic nature. So explosion of connected devices, we're going to see the hybrid working environment be the new norm. And so you're going to have teachers and students and in other verticals, employees that are just all around the globe, living in different places, all communicating like never before. So I think we're going to see the human interaction and we're going to see the connected world just transform over the next five to 10 years. And we as an IT organization need to have the infrastructure and the IT tools to be able to support this transformation. I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, it's fascinating to me from from an outside perspective. Also, I'm hoping that you know electricity keeps up with all of us. <laughs> 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 We're all plugging in. I, I know in my house everything's plugged in everywhere, and so I'm really hoping that you know all of the grids continue to support us in that mechanism as well. But it's been great talking with you today, Roger. And I'm I'm just so fascinated by YBot. For our listeners, again, we'll give you the website. It's YBot.com. A lot of great information on there, including your, your 2020 Mobile Breakthrough Awards winner, which is really key, I think, particularly for 2020, when we were yes. in such chaos. Roger, if someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, just uh, emails fine, rrsands, S-A-N-D-S, at ybot.com, W-Y-E-B-O-T. So just rsands at ybot.com. Um, anybody can reach out. That's fine. You have questions. You have a topic. You just want to um, bounce off us. We have over 100 years of Wi-Fi experience on the team, over 20 patents. So this is the space that we love. And uh, we really enjoy building partnerships and helping customers. That's our focus, long-term partnerships, because we realize these networks are going to continue to evolve. Excellent. Well, thank you today for being on the show. I so appreciate it. We'll have, again, all of the information available on our site, and we hope listeners that you take a chance to look through their website and also to reach out to Roger if you have questions. Remember that our podcast is available on Spotify, Audible, Apple, iHeartRadio, Google, Acast, and Stitcher. Roger, thanks again. And thanks to all of our listeners as always. And as you know, we always say, keep on learning. Thank you for listening to EdTech Speaks with EdTech strategist, Cher Downing. To learn more about the services Downing EdTech and its staff can provide you, find us at www.downingedtech.com. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to share it. We'd also like to hear from you regarding any suggestions for topics or guests and the value you received from our show. Check back for new podcasts with featured guests at www.downingedtech.com backslash podcast. Thank you.